All right, uh, Erica Ayala here with Liz Knox and Sarah Nurse of the PWHPA. And we're talking, uh, it's been about a day, a little over 24 hours since the PWHPA statement came out um, and lots of news came out regarding not only what the organization hopes to do in, in conversation about uh, racism, race, racial injustice, but also some changes in leadership. So first of all, thank you both for joining me here to talk a little bit um, more about the, the statement and, and kind of um, your, your, both of your roles in it. Um, so Liz, Sarah, first, first thing I like to do, especially in getting into conversations about race and racism is like, let's do a check-in. Like, like, what's the vibe today? What was something good that happened in your world today? Oh, goodness. Well, actually, yesterday, I ended up hanging out with Natalie Spooner, and we actually had a nice little sleepover. So we woke up, had some coffee, had some breakfast. <laughs> and it was nice because I haven't had, you know, like friends in a while just because of the whole COVID and everything that's going on. So it's always nice to just get away and, and hang out with your friends. I love that. <laughs> yeah, nothing, uh, nothing groundbreaking on my end. I just went to work today. And, um, you know, I'm lucky to be sitting here with you guys talking. Aww. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. So well, what about you? Oh, thank, yeah. <laughs> thank you for asking. Like no one ever asks me that. But uh, now I was talking to Noxie a little bit and I got some some great shopping in. Uh, so that's always good. You know, I'm, I'm doing a, a feng shui here. Got my got my green plants. So I just had a nice relaxing day before what will be, uh, you know, uh, a jam packed evening of women's sports. So I can't complain either way. So I'm good. But thank you for asking. <laughs> Um, all right, so we're going to get into the, the PWHPA statement, and uh, it's the statement on diversity and inclusion in hockey. And the one thing that I really enjoyed about the statement is that, you know, it really aimed to, from my perspective, uh, tackle some of what can be, what can come after just a statement, um, and there are resources in there, um, et cetera. But the one thing that I do just want to get into right away is that the statement also acknowledged that the statement was a little bit late. So um, I, I did want to talk about some of the, the conversations that the PWHPA had there because, you know, in part, it seems like the statement was late because there, there were some things that you as an organization wanted to talk about. So, you know, Liz, why don't we start with you? Um, just kind of reaction to like, hey, yeah, we know the statement's late, but in your perspective, why uh, was yesterday the right time to, to put out this statement? Yeah, I mean, I definitely think, um, you know, from a PR standpoint, would we have liked it to be a little bit earlier? Definitely. Um, you know, just from everything that was happening, um, you know, as a board, we wanted to make sure that we had kind of everything Every, we, we want to tackle all the issues that we, we had in mind, right? And um, part of that, obviously, was talking to some of our BIPOC players. So um, logistics of that is one part of it. And obviously, like, I just text nurse, like, pretty much every day now. We're, like, besties. I just, like, hit her up and be like, hey, how's your day going? Like, let's talk about race and hockey, like, probably for the last month. So, I mean, that was my first point of contact. And then it was really more about branching out from there. And, and, you know, I don't, we don't want to put the work just on Sarah to speak for all the BIPOC players in women's hockey. So, you know, there were some bigger conversations that happened that that's like a little bit of a teaser of things to come. Um, and of course we reached out to, to people that we trust and, and writers and scholars that we trust to be like, you know, let's not just throw out some, some hollow words. Let's not just say something let's make sure that there's action behind it. And so a lot of moving pieces um, very quickly uh, and also not quickly, right? I mean, the statement is late, but it, it, it was important to us that there was work behind it. So um, yeah, I mean, it was, um, I'm, I'm proud of what we said. I'm proud of the actions that we're you know, gonna put in place and that we already have. And Sarah, I wanna go to you because as a lot of things were playing out as far as conversations in, in social media, I, I had noticed that you had taken an active role in sharing information, me not being in Canada. I mean, you know, I don't know of things that happen uh, north of, of my border. Um, 
but I, I, you were one of the, the people that I, I could kind of rely on to, you know, get a finger on the pulse of what is happening in Canada, but also you're just having your voice and, and loaning your voice to a time where the larger hockey community is, has not been very comfortable. It's been you and Soroya Tinker has been great. So I, I want to get your perspective on, on the timing of the statement and, and maybe some ways that, as you told Emily Kap Kaplan, that you've been able to kind of really challenge uh, your peers to, to think differently about, about how to approach racism in women's hockey. Mm -hmm. Obviously, as Liz mentioned, the timing of our statement was far too late. Um, we would have loved to have gotten that out sooner, but with all the moving parts and, and what we actually wanted to accomplish, um, it did take a little bit of time. But I think even with us taking the action and, and myself getting put onto the board, I hope that when these things continue to happen and the next time things need to be done, we can be quicker. Like we want to be proactive in that approach. And so with the PWHP statement out, we wanted to take action and we wanted our statement not to be empty words um, because that's not meaningful. I know when I read statements like that, they really tick me off. And that's why we, as a Players Association, worked very hard on the statement. We, we worked on it for hours. And I think with my own addition um, to the statement, I was able to bring up points that may not have been thought of um, if there was only the seven other women working on it, right? Because I have a different perspective, I have a different experience. And so, I mean, by Noxie bringing me in, um, we've been able to have great conversations, not only in the last few months, but we've been able to establish a pretty good and open relationship. And I think it's been pretty mutually beneficial because again, if there's something that I haven't been happy about, um, Noxie's kind of been my connection to the board. And so it's just opening up those lines of communication so that we can ultimately make our women's hockey world a better place. Yeah, and you obviously uh, alluded to the fact that Liz Knox has been a member of the board, but has stepped down for you, Sarah, to have that space. So, you know, I want this to be just a, like a cut and dry logistical question here. But, you know, Liz, would it, was there a way for you to to also be on the board? Or, you know, was this something just kind of written in how the PWHPA is operating, that there are only a certain amount of players? Um, just if you could, you know, um, explain that a little bit to viewers. Yeah, logistically, um, you know, we have to have an odd number so that when certain things go to a vote that there, you know, there's definitely a majority. Um, so that was one thing that was taken into consideration. I mean, honestly, like our law team was amazing. They were open to any idea of how we can make this happen. But I also felt that there was something, you know, powerful about saying like, like, I hope that other people look at this action and, and, you know, really self-reflect and just say, yeah, like I, I didn't have to give up, you know, that much to make room for somebody who's been, you know, deprived of a voice for a very long time. And like, it's a, it's a sidestep in my opinion, for me, it's just me stepping aside. I'm still, you know, I'm still active, you know, in the conversations on the board, I don't have a vote. So that's why, you know, Sarah would um, take over my contract and, and, you know, fulfill that, that set time that was, um, you know, laid out for me when I joined the board. But I mean, at the end of the day, like Sarah's vote is going to reflect what I want anyway. So the vote really isn't going to change. And at the, at, at the same time, now it's not me going to Sarah speaking, you know, to other BIPOC players saying, how do you guys feel about this? It's like, let's just hear it from Sarah. You know, this is, this is why it's important to have that representation because it takes me to ask her to get that information and that shouldn't happen. It should just be an experiential, well, Hey guys, like, have you ever thought of this? Right. And it shouldn't be a second thought. It should be immediate. It should be right away. And with Sarah on the board, you know, that's, I think somewhat achieved. And something that I appreciated, uh, Liz, that you were able to talk with Emily about is that, you know, that this is probably a blind spot of, of the board to begin with. And that is something that we're hearing a lot as conversations continue around, um, again, racism, racial injustice. And so I, I appreciated that. But I also think there's another aspect of this conversation that, um, if I'm blunt, is is wondering if you know this is 
uh, just uh, something that you know is is trying to to show that there is this progress progressive movement um, and and that it doesn't really take into account um, you know bringing in other BIPOC players because while Sarah can speak to some experiences she certainly can't speak to all you know it, the. The, the bluntness of it is that, you know, there, there are these conversations of uh, do BIPOC players or people enter into leadership because, you know, the world is burning and everyone wants to have conversations of racism. Is it on merit? Um, you know, was that something that that you had conversation uh, with the other leadership um, about um, in agreeing to take this role? I think for this particular role, um, as Liz kind of mentioned, her new role within the board as being kind of on that advisory side, I think it would have been very easy for them to bring me in on that advisory side and not actually put me on the board so that I actually get a vote. And so the fact that we actually made this swap, I think, is something very important to note because ultimately they bring me into an advisor role. It's me coming in and doing extra work for them. Do you, under, do you kind of understand what I mean? Sure. And so... <laughs> pretty much for my entire life. Um, obviously, when I've been brought someplace, it's like, man, am I the, am I the diversity vote here or, or how's it going? But I think I've come to terms and, and had confidence in myself as a leader, um, both on and off of the ice and really wanting to prove that my accomplishments are from my own merit. Um, we talked about racism and women's hockey. And I remember, Erica, we did an interview probably last year where you discussed racism and women's hockey. And I remember being kind of dumbfounded about that interview that we did because I was like, I know my personal experiences and I've never actually been outright called a racial slur, right? But I was like, is there racism in women's hockey because there are no women of color in hockey? And that interview just completely dumbfounded me because I was like, well, why aren't there women of color in hockey? And that's what ultimately, like, I want to step in in this leadership role and help change and help show little Black girls, little Indigenous girls, little girls of color that they can step up and be a part of the hockey world. Like, that's my ultimate goal, because I know if I would have been able to see um, a woman color in a leadership role in hockey at all, I would have been pumped for it. And so I just want to help if I can be that one little piece of inspiration for some little girl, like, that's what I want to do. Like, not to pump Sarah's tires at all, but, like, this has been, like, without either of us knowing, this has been, like, an ongoing, weird sort of interview. Like, every time I confide in Sarah, like, I confide in her with, like, my own personal feelings, too, and she confides in me, and, like, not just about race, but just about, you know, women's hockey and our struggle in general. And, like, every little time, I'm, like, getting a little bit of information about Sarah and, like, how she thinks and, like, Obviously, she's an amazing hockey player and a superstar and, like, deserves all the accolades she gets that way. But also, like, she really does think about other people. You know, we've had conversations about what, where does a non-national team member fit in this dialogue? Or where does a trans member fit in this dialogue? Like, how do we, you know, support our LGBTQ community? And I was like, I'm not going to lie. I love Sarah. But when I first met her, I was like, me and her have nothing in common. Like, I did not think this was going to be a friendship that would grow the way it did. And honestly, like, part of my stepping aside for her to fill, you know, my shoes, so to speak, on the board is that she's more than qualified. This is not just adding, not just adding a BIPOC voice to the board, but it's adding so much more. And I personally wouldn't do it unless I knew that the person coming in was going to do a better job than me. Sarah, I spoke to your cousin earlier today, and what what Noxie said is exactly what Kia said as well. Yeah, obviously, I'm proud of Sarah um, for for stepping into that role. It's not easy to to be there and speak up and know that you know majority of the time there's going to be people who agree with you and a, a lot of people who don't. Um, but I appreciate the fact that she's willing to step up there and really share her side of the story, be able to be a voice for some people who don't necessarily have that platform to do that. Um, and she's someone who's outspoken. Uh, she's a great person. She's had her own experiences and fought through them and she's resilient. So um, I think it'll be great that she's up there and, and really making a difference. Um, with myself, you know, kind of being in this leadership role, I obviously have good connections with the other Black Indigenous players of color um, within our organization. And so I think that it's great that I have that dialogue already open. You know, I talk to Blake Bolden all the time. I talk to Bridget Laquette. And so it's just having those lines of communication open and having somebody that, you know, they know and trust 
in, in this position. And so that's something that I also want to add, because again, my experiences are very different than Blake's. They're very different from Bridget's. And I want to make sure that their voices are heard as well. And that's extremely important, especially in a space where, I mean, compared to your cousin, that's in a league that 80% of the players are black. Uh, that's not your experience at all, um, to your point. And going back to a conversation that you and I had, I think, um, around February or March, um, you know, one of the things that you said is that there are still things that you still have to learn and that there are experiences that regardless of if it's someone that identifies the way that you do that, again, that, that lived experience is different. And I think that also is what I enjoyed about the statement because there were educational resources, there were organizations uh, that were uh, named and, and some action steps. So Sarah, I'll go to you first. Um, when it came to pulling that together, I mean, what, what did you want or what was the hope from your perspective of, of what that could do um, and, and how that could make this PWHPA statement different than what is already out there specifically in the hockey space? I think for us, when we were um, pulling resources and thinking of things that we wanted to provide to our fans and supporters is one thing that was very important to understand is the PWHPA, our fan base, um, majority white, right? And so we wanted to provide resources that maybe they had never even thought of looking for, they didn't know existed. Um, and we also wanted to amplify BIPOC voices. And so there are different um, resources on that, or educational resources on that guide that we wanted to amplify. And we, want, we realized that their voices are very important, um, not only in society, but in the hockey world. It's gonna be relevant to the people that follow us. So it was very important for us to do that. Um, I mean, in, in my Instagram, I've had a link of resources up for the last couple of months that people can go and check out because there are important pieces of information out there. I mean, we have Dr. Courtney Cito's um, anti-racism in sport paper, and it's an incredible paper to read. And I was fortunate enough to be on the call where they actually answered a bunch of questions going through the paper. And it's something that everybody should read. Um, it's, it's pretty eye-opening. And again, that was one of the things that we provided because we think it's important for our fans and our supporters to really grab, grab a hold of. And Liz, I know that you have been talking about Dr. Courtney Sito's work and I have had conversations uh, with her. But, you know, I also want to think about, you know, ways that, again, compared to what we've seen in hockey, uh, thinking about even the Hockey Diversity Alliance, some of what happened as hockey returned to play. From your perspective, Liz, you know, what makes this statement different and, and what is your hope um, regarding the resource list and, and how women's hockey fans or just hockey fans in general will engage with that? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, I think that we aspire to be the group that um, can change the culture of hockey. I mean, it's, it's a pretty lofty goal, but um, not to throw too much shade, but the NHL has a long way to go, you know, and I kind of said that in, in my article with Emily, um, you know, we can have you can play nights and we can say hockey's for everyone, but if you really mean it, I mean, the PWHPA and women's hockey leaders in general want to be the standard of saying, okay, you know, if you guys want to start somewhere, start with us because we're going to bring our, you know, we're going to bring our allies with us. You know, we're going to bring our supporters with us. And then as Sarah was saying, we have such a, you know, we're reaching such a diverse group as fans. And I think that we need to, be, you know, better representation for that. Um, and, and moving forward, I mean, that would be our goal is just to, I think I kind of said in the article, like, we're trying to balance how much we want to fit in and how much we want to stand out. And in hockey culture in general, as women, that's been something that we've always struggled with. You know, um, we are a different game, but we're not so different that you can't love watching us. And we are different athletes. I mean, you know, I would say 99, if not 100% of our athletes are well-educated, um, you know, articulate driven individuals, and they deserve a voice. Um, you know, our BIPOC players deserve a voice. They've come through university and they're scholars. And, you know, I think that we're kind of trying to figure ourselves out a little bit right now. And it's unfortunate that it's taken to 2020 to hit that maturity. But at the same time, 
you know, the women's game is relatively young in terms of how much growth we've seen over the last hundred years. And, um, but I think we're kind of at that point now where we're, we're, you know, we're looking for that tipping point. We're looking for that boiling point to just uh, take off. I mean, I think we're, we're finding our voice we're finding our advocacy and, you know, good things can happen from that. I love that. And I have certainly inserted myself into the conversation of women's sports, really wanting women's hockey to look at the WNBA as a model in all ways, not just in kind of how they were supported and are still supported by the NBA, um, but also what they've done in the social justice space. So loved to see a little shout out to, to the ladies uh, basketball, to the WNBA in, in the statement. But the WNBA has been so consistent but that consistency has come uh, at a cost. I mean, it's, it's draining. It's four years ago, you know, no one wanted to, to talk about Maya Moore. Um, and there are, were police officers that walked out and did not offer security, private security, because they wore shirts that said, change starts with us. Flash forward to 2020 and everyone's writing about Maya Moore because she took two years away from her sport um, to, to help a family friend and to really talk about prosecutor prosecutorial that's a tough word to say uh, misconduct <laughs> so tough uh misconduct and has really you know stayed focused this is still the entry point for the PWHPA and for women's hockey but i wonder if either of you has given thought to in the scope of all that is social justice, anti-racism work. Is there something that you're very drawn to when it comes to being able to carve out that space in women's hockey? Sarah, maybe we'll start with you. Mm -hmm. I mean, with looking at the women of the WNBA, like they're absolutely incredible. Um, you look at them and what they've been doing for the last four plus years. Um, they've been true leaders in this space. And you can look at other professional sports leagues and they've been looking at the WNBA. Um, change starts with us like that's something that resonates so much with me because I think as women's hockey players um, we struggle with the fact of do we want to stand up and say something because we don't get brought into the conversation at all we're left behind all the time nobody people say they don't care about us and so it's like we struggle with the fact of okay like we kind of want that recognition like we want to be out there we want to be playing the sport we love like the WNBA players but we're not there yet and so it's like using our platforms is that going to set our sport back but I think what's important is like to understand that hey historically if you want something to change like bring women to the table because they get it done and so I think in the hockey space like we can be leaders here um, I like to think of us as women's hockey players like we're pretty open um and, and inclusive and we want to drive that even more forward with our anti-racist racism efforts because ultimately we have a big lgbtq community um uh and it's like okay let's add people of diverse races and i think as we move forward as a women's hockey community we can be leaders because they're amazing leaders across our hockey community and that's something that we need to understand and we need to realize and if we value equity and equality and equal opportunity like it needs to be for everybody it's not just we want to value equal opportunity for women it's no we want to value equal opportunity for everybody everybody who may feel forgotten left behind like we want to do that and so i think ultimately us being leaders in that space is going to be huge and we need to realize that we have a voice we found our voice and i want to keep pushing forward together and how about for you noxie like have you thought of anything in particular that you know, if, if you or the PWHPA could like really focus in on that, that would look like and feel like success for you. You know what? I, I hope this isn't a cop out answer. Um, I have things that I'm personally passionate about, but I think that um, like what I'm passionate about in my role as, as a, you know, a PA advisor now is carving out that space for our players to use their voice, to realize that they have a platform um, I'm a non-national team member, you know, I, I work a, on a good day. It's a nine to five. Most of the times it's like a seven to seven. <laughs> like I'm like blue collar trying to make it in emergency services. Like I just, I don't really fit in the mold of what a professional women's hockey player looks like. Um, and I think that I'm trying to use the platform that I do have to show other players that, yeah, like you're going to, you may get some 
bad reviews. You may say the wrong thing sometimes. Like you may get Joe Hockey 9877248 saying like, hey, go back to the kitchen. But like at the end of the day, like you do have people that follow you. You do have kids and friends and allies and people that you meet over social media that actually look at you and say, hey, like you have a voice. Like I, I want to know what you think about this. And I think that it's a really untapped market in women's hockey because I know the players that I've played with and against. And as I was saying earlier, they are educated, intelligent people that are, as Sarah was kind of alluding to, a little bit afraid to say something. And so I think in terms of carving out space and especially in the hockey world, which quite frankly, lacks a lot of personality on the men's side, (laughs) like, you know, until after retirement, then they all have, you know, whatever podcast or broadcasting, whatever, um, you know, be a personality. What they like good, good will come of it. Be a personality. Talk about things that you're passionate about. Advocate for your teammates. Um, (laughs) if it comes from a genuine place, you'll never have to question why you're doing it. I love that. Yeah. And we're all here for the personality while you're on the ice. Let's go for it. Get a little spicy every once in a while. <laughs> you know, one of my new favorite hashtags right now is wobble tea. Oh, so much wobble That's tea. That's unreal. I love it. It's just yeah. like all the sass. We need more of that in the women's hockey space. <laughs> we do. <laughs> do it for the content. I mean, exactly. Probably right, not the greatest thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not the greatest thing to end a, a whole conversation on racism about. Like, yeah, just do it for the content. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but to your point, yes, like really, just being your full self. I think is 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 what I got from that, and uh, I think it's Marianne Williamson. Uh, and it was in a, like a Disney movie or something, but you know, she says like, when you will allow your light to shine, you give permission for others to let their light shine. And I, I just always, I think that again, women in sports are always kind of pushing sports to be more inclusive, um, to be more thoughtful and, and open and progressive. And so I'm really looking forward to what will come of, of this statement, maybe a little late out the gate, but you know what, you're here. And I think ultimately that's kind of the takeaway for me is that there are so many people that are content to not show up and worse. And so, you know, we'll, we got to figure it out together, but, but you're here, you know, so, so let's, uh, let's get it done. I'm, I'm excited for, for what will come. Um, but before we close out, I just do want to give you the opportunity, uh, last words, uh, you know, I'll leave them with, with you both things that you're really proud of when it comes to how the statement was able to come together. Go for it, Noxie. I'll race you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think, um, you know, as a players association, collaborating with our players, collaborating with you know, the resources that we have. Bringing Sarah on was a huge step for us. Um, as we said, a huge blind spot. You know, she shared her resources. Um, and, not, and, and again, that comes from a genuine place. That comes from, you know, her passions. And that's, you know, added value to the board. And we need to keep growing from there because she's just one individual, albeit an amazing individual. But Um, You know, she cannot speak for all of our BIPOC players. And I think this is just step one. I think that's what I'm most proud of is that as a board, we recognize this is just step one. Yeah. And I think just, just to kind of go off of that, um, being in the conversations over the last um, little bit and just seeing the genuine care and wanting to get this right and, and wanting to make this right and really actually taking a stance because there have been so many statements that have been umbrella statements and not really, I guess, drawing a line in the sand. And I think I'm proud of us for drawing a line on the sand and saying, this is where we stand on this subject. Um, basically, if you're not on the bus, this is where we're going. If you're not on, you can get off because we, we want to make hockey an inclusive space. And if you're not on board, um, we don't need you, essentially. Um, and so I'm very proud of the direction that we're going. Okay, with the tea. <laughs> <laughs> It's true. It's true. I saw a quote the other day. I think it was, I'm not, remember, I don't remember who said it, but it was, it was saying something about it's, it's not about the speed. It's about the direction. And I know we were late with the statement and I'm not 
super impressed. I'm, I'm a little disappointed that we were late with the statement, but I like the direction that we're going in and I hope that we continue that way. I love it. Well, Liz Knox, Sarah Nurse, as always, thank you so much for your time. And, and like I said, I look forward to seeing where this will come, but don't, don't worry. I will challenge you as well. We hope <laughs> That's so. what you're here for. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Also, it, love that I'm like matching your back, your wall. I know. <laughs> If you put me, if you put me on this wall, you just blend right in. Just feel like.